Kia ora koutou, ngā mahi nunui, many greetings. Ko rogomai wahine me kahungunu me ngāti pāhawera a mai iwi, my tribes. Ngai Tahumata Whaiti is my clan. And this image is of Taiporitu, mahia mai tāwhiti on the east coast of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Taiporitu is where I was raised, it's my true home, my land and my sea. Taiporitu is where our ancestral voyaging waka, the Takitamu, landed. And Taiporitu is the ancestral name which translates to the sound of the sea booming on the rock. I greet you from my homelands and from my seas. And this is how I know my Turanga Waiwai, my place to stand on Papatuan Luku, the Earth Mother. My name is Desna Fanga Sholem. I'm an artist, a designer, a researcher, a science communicator, and I'm Māori, Tangata Whenua, people of the land. I'd like to acknowledge the lands that we now stand upon and the people of this land, the Jā Jā Warangi. Ngā mahi nunui, many greetings. When Roz contacted me and um, extended the invitation to participate in this forum, I asked her about um, her interest in my work and what I might be able to do to contribute to your cultural landscape here. Um, Ross spoke about the framework for Art Lands Victoria and how it has been developed from the nine goals outlined in the Jā Jā Warangi country plan and how that's been translated into our framework for this event. Um, this approach really resonated with me and I absolutely applaud would wholeheartedly love to see this being employed as a standard way of creating an event and platforms such as these. This connected approach is an effective step towards bridging the cultural divide when we think of these events as containers for aligning our purpose and generating new knowledge, an intentional framework which can become embodied in our practices, a resonant container for place-based creativity and valuing the environment as a whole and also our own personal contribution to identity. This establishes long-term, sustaining, strong relationships. All of my work centres around this kind of space, about exploring the eco-philosophical and community-connected values of Mataranga Māori or Māori knowledge systems. These are shared by our peoples when they participate and they attend and they give voice to their thoughts in forums such as these. My work spans multiple disciplines and focuses from Māori cultural paradigms to design work and artwork, governance positions and all of the senses around a core of indigenous voice advocacy. My, my recent master's was produced under the banner of science communication, which I see as a close alignment to design thinking practices. These use methods of communicating, which are part, I uh, part art and part science, sorry. <laughs> the contemporary discipline of design thinking applies cross-sector approaches to complex situations aiming to create transformational change. And this is largely grounded on human-centred collaborative research processes which identify and critically discuss those issues and values within a community-specific context, a practice which moves knowledge and potential solutions forward through alignment of purpose. In any situation which I work in, I acknowledge and attempt to carry forward the work which my ancestors have done before me and understand that my contribution is just one point in an intergenerational line or web of many peoples people of the land. This is Iha Kafanga, my ancestor who is five generations before me. And before him there were 16 generations to Rongmai Wahine and Kahungunu who are the ancest my eponymous ancestors for my tribe. I know of 21 generations before me at Taipurutu, Mahia Mai Tafiti, and so I think of 21 generations that will come after myself and my siblings and the changes that they might see and what legacies I might leave them by my decisions. My ancestors teach me resilience and life force and they give me a sense of continuity and place. This is Waikawa, the island off the end of the Mahia Peninsula and it's owned by my clan and it's also where Fanga lived as a young child. My father used to journey here uh, seasonally every year to gather the edible seaweed karingo which sustained us throughout the year. In 1925 in a Māori land court hearing, one of my ancestors described his knowledge of occupation of this land to prove his ownership through the names of various sites, the places where our people gathered food and the associated rahui. Rahui are contemporary or temporary bands, should I say, on food such as fish or birds or plants or fruit from an area due to seasonal breeding or regeneration needs or if a death had occurred at the site. A notable Māori researcher, Mason Jury, described the essential primary characteristic of indigenous peoples 
as being less dependent on colonisation or sovereignty or a sense of grievance than on a long-standing relationship with the land, the forests, the waterways, the ocean and the air. Within te ao Māori, the concept of respect of the individual is bound to the relationship and contribution one has made to our community and our guardianship of place. The level of respect is indicated through mana. Mana can be defined as the identity of authority and of prestige and has a number of dimensions including the wairua or the spirit of our ancestors. The relationship to Māori, which is life force of the whenua, the land, and the wairua or the spirit of the individual. If one is to adhere to tikanga or our ethics within a community, one must respect and uphold the manner of all of those involved. I was uh, fortunate recently, about seven years ago, to be contracted as a photography researcher in our Treaty of Waitangi claims. And my elder, Walter Wilson, who you see on the left-hand side there, decided that we were all going to take our clan out to our significant sites as we recorded them. So theoretically, we were recording them for the Crown to... Uh, to prove our occupation of place over time. But what we were really doing was just gathering all of our people together and sharing our stories on these sites. And it was a phenomenal experience. Uh, this took motorbikes and four-wheel drives and boats and um, you know a few incidences like getting the four-wheel drive stuck in the sand dunes. Not me, but those guys, the farmers, they got their stuck. Uh, <laughs> and we, we had this really moving experience of getting to know our landscape intimately and getting to know all of the names of the places, these things, places that I've heard about for years but never been able to visit. And so now when I drive through that landscape or I walk through that landscape, I don't see hills and trees and lakes and seas. I see Onipoto, I see Korito, I see Tani Mahuta. I see all of the names of these, these living entities. So Tanga took Iho or treasure handed down, is the terminology used within the Tuturi Whenua Māori Act 1993. And this is the law that governs all of the communally owned Māori land in New Zealand. Taonga Tukuiho describes the relationship that we as Māori have with our ancestral lands and therefore reflects Māori cultural values. Landscape, as we all know, is a cultural construct and each culture understands it, the landscape according to that culture's values. As a catalyst for developing innovation and resilience in land occupation, indigenous knowledge and belief systems of the environment have great potential to enhance our contemporary practices. This hill that you can see in the, photo, in the photo there is actually a whale. There were seven whales at home that were owned by a tohunga and a ancestor. And he used to send them out into the sea every day and they'd gather uh, news and stories from the fish and from the eels and from all of the different creatures that were around the coast. And they'd bring those stories back to uh, our tohunga every night. And so he got to learn what was the lay of the land and what was going on within his ecology. So the youngest whale was a little bit of a daydreamer. And uh, he tended to dawdle a lot and he didn't always gather that much news. And he was always kind of lagging behind. And sometimes he turned up late to things. And as you can imagine, often he slept in. The tohunga got kind of pissed off with this. So he told him off again and again and again. And then one morning, the little whale slept in way too late. And so the tohunga turned them all into hills. So he's a little bit severe. <laughs> but now there are seven whales that lay in the lands of my clan, and the littlest whale sleeps up the top of a valley, which is called Waiatai. It's a long, a long way from the coast. And there were some geology, uh, geologists that have been there recently and tested the soil. And around about 1,500 years ago, there was an inundation of water, seawater, up that valley. So theoretically, apparently, Māori have only been in New Zealand for about 500 years. This is pingao, which is a valued essential weaving grass because of its golden hue. It holds this even after you've uh, harvested and woven it into kete or woven bags. The story of the pingao is that at the beginning of time, there was a great conflict between Tāne, the god of the forest, and his brother Tangaro, god of the sea. Tangaroa was jealous of Tane's success in separating Rangi Nui, the sky father, and Papatua Nuku, the earth mother. Tane tried to end the warring between the two of them, and as a sign of peace, he plucked out his eyebrows and gave them to Tangaroa. They've got a slightly weird relationship going on here, but anyway, you know, <laughs> you can imagine that you can uh, have some empathy for the pain that he was creating in order to say, I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> However, as brothers tend to do, Tangaroa's jealousy was so great that he couldn't find it in his heart to forgive Tane, and so he threw the eyebrows back onto the shore. 
and there they grow today is Pingal, the golden sand sedge. And this is the boundary between the forest and the sea. And in his continuing anger, Tangaroa is still fighting against the domains of Tani Mahuta. So for Māori, all things in the natural environment, tangible and intangible, our resources, our species or places are interconnected and possess a life energy, the Māori. Sustaining the Māori of Taonga, which is our valued objects, guides our interactions with the environment and this exercise is central to Kaitiakitanga, which is a guardianship principle. This guardianship uh, ethos is based on an eco-philosophical understanding of ourselves as an integral part of the environment rather than a separate element. And seeing the environment as taonga denotes a respectful and relation, uh, reciprocal relationship. Through this relational lens, Te Ao Māori considers ways to improve mutual health of people and place, rather than as distinct separation of the environment as other or non-living. So to quote Jeff Park, that sense of connection that has confronted Europeans throughout the Pacific in the elemental terms of matter and energy, people ultimately are land, no more, no less than the birds, the insects, the trees and seeds and the constant process of their birth and growth and decay and the movement of them and their parts through the landscape. This is a quiet little whare a house which currently sits in the front paddock of one of our hapu, our clan. And it's been moved many times and its cloak of carvings removed. So we understand our whare as the built form of our ancestors. At the front of the meeting house is the kōruru, which is usually carved to represent the face of our ancestor. There are two long beams which are trailing down the side, and these are the maihi, and they represent the arms, and then obviously there are the fingers of the rapa rapa at the end, or the ancestor's fingers. And supporting the beams are the amo, or the legs which hold up the entirety of the building. The carvings have been stripped from this house and it sits quietly out the back of one of my cousin's houses. However, inside the humble whare are detailed carvings and paintings and woven panels. And these tell place-based narratives which can be very specific to a community and um, this is knowledge which has been generated over long-term occupation of specific environments. And it's this living with and knowing of the environment that is the wairua or the spirit of our tribal identities. The kōwhaiwhai, which you see here, are the ribs of our ancestor. These are the painted patterns which tell our stories of occupation of place. They tell of birth and of death and of uh, continuation of the peoples that have always been connected to this place. And the woven panels on the back walls also tell of our climbing through the stars. They tell area-specific experiences and spiritual beliefs and ancestral narratives which are woven together which create a unique and wholly integrated experience of our particular homes. So I want to talk a little bit about my practice in our spaces which comes from these stories. As an indigenous creative practitioner, our Māori or life force is central to all of my uh, all of my work, it's a central concept which I use on a day-to-day -day basis. In our worldview, the Māori connects the people and the spirit to all within the natural physical world and the taonga in the form of the highly valued man-made objects. These also carry the Māori of the maker. The art forms and design objects is seen ha as having an intimate relationship with both the environment and the people, with the Māori being the connective force bet between these. I also attempt to very consciously create balance, so the balance between, of energy between tapu and noa, the sacred and the open. And the balance of energy between the tāne and wahine, between male and female. And tapo, the night of thoughts, te ao marama, the creative daylight of being and doing. I've also been collaborating collaborating a bit recently with my partner John Hall who's a European trained blacksmith and with Welsh ancestral roots. We've collaborated on a few pieces having a tutu of what it looks like at the intersection of those apparently sort of contradicting cultures. Um, exploring the intersections of his craftsmanship from Europe and my cultural connections to the, to the Pacific has come up with things like John's practice of tool making and chiseling and steel which bears a lot of similarities to the adzes and the moko or the traditional tattooing practices of my ancestors where the chisel splits the skin steel apart rather than the removing of material in the same way that you do with wood carving. 
this series of works titled Foreign Object, Hints at Māori Ancestral Fortification and Earthworks, and Ancestral Tools such as Adzes. However, we've utilised European methods of manufacture and materials, and so it equally references the medieval smithies of Europe. This is some of my graphic artwork, which explores the concepts of tangata whenua, the people of the land, with the whales floating in the background and my ancestors' faces in the foreground. And I've also looked at that time of, of evening when the light starts to shift and it reflects on the sea, because we're also tangata moana, we're people of the sea and we're people of wider spirit. and we all hold within us Māori, the life force. These are some recent light, uh, light artworks which I collaborated with Storybox to create. They're inspired by Pofenua, which are land symbols of support, and they represent creative spirit, which is generated from the environment. The light within these uh, slowly shifts and ebbs and flows and pulses over time. So we've moved them around the country and they connect to each place. And people's response to them has been to play amongst them. There's so much enjoyment of that, I guess, connection with the same kind of form as them. Enjoyment of our creative spirit and the energy of the generations of people moving through place. This is the Farikai, the dining hall for my... Oh, it's not, this one is. <laughs> this is the Farikai, the dining hall for my clan, my hapu, which sits in the same complex of buildings as our meeting house, so uh, that meeting house that you saw earlier. This, like many of the marae dining halls in my lands, is a large open space. It's humble, it's very simple and honest, and it's practical. The structure is entirely on display, and it's entirely based on its usability for large gatherings. These are ubiquitous folding trestle tables and seats, and also softly falling light from the stained glass windows at the end of the hall. And when I walk in these spaces, I feel my ancestors and my current clan and the generations before and after and their conversations that they share over food from our land and sea. In 2012, I designed a, a museum exhibition called Ukaipo, which means the milk of the mother at night. The design of the exhibition display cases draws heavily upon what was familiar to me, which is the recognisable humble meeting house furniture. Such as the trestle tables in our dining hall. And I also sought to simply elevate the taonga, our valued objects, so things that are made in ponamu, and, uh, which is greenstone, and also bone, which have the light resonating through them. These carry our life essence and spirits of our makers and also those who have worn them. And it was therefore also important to me that the stands on which, which held the objects are visible, acknowledging the makers of the exhibition and their craft as well. And these are the ancestral taonga. So they were lit behind by a glowing sinuous wall which references the star paths of our voyaging ancestors and how they arrived in New Zealand. This case design was a simple nod to our ancestral waka, our ancestral canoes, and which voyaged through all of our seas and our spirits, our minds and our identities as we introduce ourselves. So I've spoken quite a bit about Māori as a collective people, and I want to share a little bit more about my work within that space. One of my key roles for about the last 10 years or so has been as a founding member of Nga Aho, the Māori Design Professionals Network of New Zealand. In the more recent years, I've held the position of, as chairperson. Māori cultural values in relation to resource management within New Zealand are often co-joined with a preservation framework, and the practical implication of this places identity as a discrete object from evolving identity, society, philosophy, and business practices. Within the recent dominant neoliberalist focus of New Zealand policy development, the normalised view is that increasing economics and employment means that Māori will be better equipped to determine their pathway forward. But the risk in this assessment is that the overall framework of trade and societal values is not acknowledged as being embedded within a cultural paradigm, 
and in discounting this cultural knowledge, potential opportunities for assisting resource management and development is issues that are specific to New Zealand society and New Zealand place are not pursued. So Nga Ahoa aims to apply design skills to achieve Māori as aspirations and envisaging, designing and re realising a future Aotearoa. Nga Ahoa translates to the weaving of the many strands communicating a concept of bringing together the many strands of the Māori design world to explore and articulate Māori culture through strategy, planning, architecture, landscape architecture, visual communications, product design and education, basically whatever it takes to get the job done. So in essence what we're doing is creating a multidisciplinary uh, professional cultural platform and that progresses at complex issues which span across economic and social and ecological concerns. Our value proposition is our reconnection to place revisioning our landscape so that we can better see our faces in our places. We have a different value chain and a different value measure. It's about health and well-being for our peoples in unison with the environment. So Nga Aho employs or deploys indigenous creativity for outcomes that are regenerative, they're enduring and they're born of an intimate knowledge of place and people and the connected practices in between. We put forward the proposition that bringing the indigenous to the fore means designing concepts and products and frameworks and ways of doing and ways of being which have long-term meaningful outcomes and impacts for our communities. As opposed to designing more shit for me, more people that they don't really need just because it looks cool for things that who cares about whether they're doing them anyway. And why would we do this? Because this siloed, disconnected, mass-produced, factory-cut-out, passive automaton existence which has been rolled out around the colonised, westernised world doesn't serve any of us. Our Nga Aho Foundational Charter, if you will, is the Te Aranga Māori Cultural Landscape Strategy. So this eventuated as a response to an urban design protocol which has been authored by the New Zealand Ministry of the Environment in around about 2005 or 2006 recognising that there was a lack of mo clear Māori voice in this space, the Te Aranga was formed through a collective process which included a lot of uh, Māori design professionals and environmental uh, guardians from many different backgrounds and also a wide range of tribal authorities and economic entities. The strategy responds to the Treaty of Waitangi. It supports the self-determination for tribal authorities through our identity being recognised as a critical dimension of the built environment. More recently, alongside tribal authorities in Auckland and also Nga, Nga Aho members, have evolved this strategy into a set of Māori design principles. And these are a set of design principles which provide a framework or a lens which prioritises a te ao Māori point of view for Māori design integration within the built environment to better see our places and our faces. The principles deliver outcomes which help to deepen a sense of place and develop meaningful and durable relationships with our tribal authorities. So Nga Aho and Mana Whenua, or the tribal authorities, then partnered with Auckland Council to create a highly visible and accessible web platform to profile and applaud what is good, so to encourage best practice cultural design relationships. And we advocate and build dialogue which shifts thinking in the built environment and industries that are associated with it. I think one of the most powerful things that I've seen during this time is that the Māori design principles assist others who are not so familiar with Māori culture to see how they might connect with these in their work. They're a cultural bridge. And alongside this, through a hell of a lot of political pro push, we've also established a leadership position in the Auckland City Council to champion these principles. Looks all so tidy, doesn't it? Of course, the journey actually looks something more like this. We've learnt from our mistakes, our debates, we've swatted a few annoying insects along the way, we've headed off down some complete dead ends, and uh, yeah, it's taken us a while to get back on the right path. And it's not smooth, and sometimes it fails, and sometimes it succeeds. But we know that we're on a really long journey, and it's intergenerational. So empathy, or uh, keeping it real for Nga Aho, is our annual gatherings. And these are built around invites from our members to visit their home territories. So we gather to hear their stories of place and we share our skills for the support of their futures. During these gatherings we've got uh, students, design professionals, elders, children and we learn about the issues of the home people and how, what they're facing within their communities and within their homelands. We dissolve the lines between the stakeholders and the design professionals. 
issues could be like uh, whare nui rest restoration or landscape design if the water table is too high or cultural narrative expressions within the built environment, education programs. It's a really wide variety of different opportunities and needs which are offered from the local tribal community. And then we run workshops on site over the weekend. So how do we apply our interdisciplinary and intergenerational skills to the needs of the home people? We think about the current state and what the future state scenarios are going to be, and we weigh up the different options. We prototype and we draw and we create playful processes and safe spaces to build people's confidence and capability to collaborate. And we visit the studios of Māori design practitioners in the area as well to inspire. And this helps us to better understand what might be needed from our up-and-coming designers in their cultural community contexts. Unsurprisingly, it's often quite different and more holistic skills than what the tertiary institutes understand as qualifiable design. We've also started to team up with other entities recently to sponsor attendance for people such as the social innovation practitioners who have been co-designing programs to address rough sleeping in New Zealand, which is unfortunately growing at a really hideously rapid rate. From these workshops, we give back anything that's produced during these gatherings to the hosting tribal identities. The gatherings nurture intergenerational, interdisciplinary, diverse community collaboration. And they provide immediate insights and responses which are grounded in the everyday realities of our people, the people who keep the home fires burning. So obviously, the next step for us was to reach out to, reach out to our other indigenous homies. So, some other fellas and us. This collaboration was with a design journal, Threaded, which is one of our members is a director in. We co-created a beautiful publication and it celebrates Māori creatives and innovators. The publication profiles indigenous visual artists, designers, choreographers, carvers, writers, architects, furniture designers, just to name a few. We've also sought out strategic partnerships with the New Zealand Design Institutes to basically bring the indigenous or bring the brown to their forums. So we've partnered with New Zealand Institute of Landscape Architects, the New Zealand Institute of Architects in Papaponamu, the New Zealand Māori and Pacific Peoples Planning Group. And we've also established uh, Aotearoa Design Award, which is uh, delivered in partnership with the Designers Institute of New Zealand. And this seeks to make visible the system dynamics, the attitudes and behaviours that affect how the design challenge or issue is framed as well as the effectiveness of the response, which is quite unique in the awards because most design awards are all about the outcome but not about the process. We award Aotearoa, so design that reflects a clear understanding of who we are and where we are in our unique corner of Wananui Akiwa, the Pacific Ocean. And this responds to our indigenous culture, our heritage and our sense of place. We award collaborative design practice, design which results from meaningful collaboration. And in doing this, we're redefining what's considered award-worthy within the design circles. In the last few years, we've been reaching out to our international indigenous whānau through hosting indigenous design gatherings and visiting them in their home territories. We've also started uh, doing some research with the National Science Challenge so many of our current our practitioners are involved in looking at opportunities to expand our knowledge and develop new best practices and advocate for targeted Māori policy outcomes at a central government level. Our challenge vision is Kaora Kaingarua, built environments which build communities. Our challenge mission is Manaki Tangata, co-created innovative research which helps transform people's dwellings into homes and communities and make them hospitable, productive and protective. So many greetings to you all, and greetings to your ancestors that you bring with you and that you embody in your work. We gather together not only as designers and artists and architects and landscape architects, writers, researchers, innovators, philosophers, musicians, design thinkers. We are mother, father, we are daughter, son, granddaughter, grandson, and we gather as our whole selves. We gather together as the living embodiment of our ancestors behind us and our generations before us. We gather together our trees, our birds, our whales, our eels, our lands, and we weave. The weaving of the many strands. This is how I know my Turanga Waiwai. I place the sand on Papatoanuku. 
Earth Mother. Tihei Mauri Ora. Thank you so much, Desna. Please stay, and uh, we're going to give the we're going to give the Slido a bit of a crack. Um, so, um, Slido, go! <laughs> hey, there we go. Yes, okay. Um, so, people who have um, submitted questions via Slido.com using the hashtag Artlands Victoria, we've got a couple that have come up on the board, um, Desna. I might start at the bottom. What's been the response to your creative cultural vision for your? Uh, new progress from your new progressive prime minister in government. Um, well, I've only spoken to her for one minute, but I did shake her hand, and now she knows my name. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure what Jacinda thinks of our mahi um, <laughs> personally, um, but I do know that we're kind of working out through local body government at the moment. I'm hoping that those uh, Tiaranga Māori design principles that we might be able to roll those out around the rest of New Zealand. Uh, Christchurch has currently got something quite similar based on their specific values of that place. Um, and uh, Montreal is currently developing some indigenous design principles based on the Tiaranga principles. So, you know, maybe if we go overseas, then they might be able to like come back to New Zealand. And yeah, I think she. Uh, I, I, I I think there's a bit of Prime Minister envy happening at the moment in, uh, <laughs> in Australia, particularly in the arts and cultural space. Is that a fair assessment, fellow Australians? <laughs> uh, a, a question down the bottom um, from Joe, not me. Uh, how does your tribal community respond to your work? Um, well, I guess one of the first things that I did, I went over, um, did the, you know, the OE uh, around about, 99, 2000, when I came home, I found out that uh, a couple of artists at home were running a tribal exhibition called Gifted Sands, which was only for Māori artists from that particular area. So I thought the best thing that I could do was basically go and work alongside them. So for the last sort of 18 years or so, I've been going home every summer and uh, manning the exhibition. So that means painting all of the walls, erecting all the walls, hanging all the artworks, selling all the artworks, packing it all down within two days. And also, you know, being in the kitchen with the tea towel. So on that basis, then largely my hapu is okay with me. <laughs> um, you talk about we a lot in your work. And how, what's your process of collaborating with other artists? Uh, I have no idea how not to collaborate. How do you go about doing individualism? If somebody could explain <laughs> that to me, then I'll tell you what collaboration <laughs> means. Write a book. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the final one we've got up there is, do you work with communities to develop projects and, and, and the, are the ideas influenced by tradition or are they from stories told to you in the communities that you're working with? Um, I guess I have difficulties with the concept of tradition, albeit that they use it because there seems to be a lack of a better descriptor, but the uh, understanding that you have with uh, as being tangata whenua with that generational intergenerational kind of concept is that you are your ancestors, you're the living embodiment of your ancestors and you are, are also the generations that are to come. So yes, I, uh, if I'm working with some people from home, then I definitely go and ask what they need first before coming up with my bright and shiny kind of ideas. I kind of feel like the design or art or science or photography or research or whatever the hell it is that I'm doing are tools to be able to articulate what it is that our communities need. They're just a different way of going about problem solving. And yeah, I referred to design thinking a little bit earlier. Uh, there's a lot of the collaborative processes within that that are enabling people to have a better voice so that they are included within the creative process. So I might just be, I might be a pencil, but somebody else has got fantastic cultural stories to tell, or there's somebody that's um, great at, you know, being in the kitchen cooking the kai, which is always important in collaborative events. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think. Uh, I don't believe in the designer as auteur, the person that comes in as the expert is just that doesn't help us either. Do we have any, we've also got, I think there's some uh, mics just that Graeme I can see has got one there. Is there anyone wanting to uh, volunteer a contribution from the, from the stage? Uh, from the, the stage, this is the stage, uh, from, the, from the audience. See a little bit of movement. Might be interested in that too. Behind you! 
Uh, how strong is the political element of your practice and how keenly are you motivated by public decolonizing values and should design thinking be more political? I think if you're indigenous, you're inherently political. It's almost like you can't be, you cannot be Māori and operating in this space without being political. That's just, that, that's actually just not an option for me. Um, I'm definitely an advocate for inclusivity and uh, for when I go into spaces, seeing who isn't invited into the conversation because our people have been there for, you know, too long or have been chopped out of the conversation. So, yes, so everything is political. Um, Decolonising, uh, you know, that's something that I, I um, yeah, that I do focus on a lot. And I was talking to one of my cousins recently and she was thinking more of perhaps that Māori decolonise themselves, whereas others might indigenise themselves. So to me, it's kind of trying to find a consciousness of who I am and how do I stand in this place and how do I contribute to this place and, and how do I stand in relation to everything around me. So that's a constant, uh, um, it does take constant awareness, I guess, in all of the spaces that I am because the normal the, that we all seem to default to or that we've been taught through our tertiary institutes anyway is very much the individual and it's the uh, success of one person above another and it's siloed practices and uh, this is the way that we kind of get awarded or said that we have knowledge qualification so mm. that does take quite a lot of unpicking but you know you can always go home and as I said get in the kitchen at your whare and then it gets bashed out of you quite quickly by the aunties so <laughs> important role for aunties there I've just realized they're, they're down here on this little monitor as well how, how much uh, risk do you uh, how much risk do you feel the life force you describe is at, at this point in time? And, and does your artwork and collaborations, do they give you hope? Yeah, they do. The Te Aranga principles have been, uh, in particular for me living within Auckland, not when I'm at home in Mahia. If I'm, home, if I'm at home in Mahia, which I do quite often, I just kind of go back home and I recharge. I can stand within the environment and I can stand on my pass site, which my ancestors have occupied for that long and I know that I'm a part of the land, but when I move back into a really urban environment and we see all of these built landscapes around us, the entire way that we're kind of constructed, the, our jobs and the buildings and the, the design of the public spaces seems to be about disconnecting people. So to me, sometimes it can be really hard to connect in with that life force within an urban environment. I um, I live in a warehouse in an industrial area as well, so that's, that, you know, it's pretty built up, but we're really lucky that there's this little stream that runs right next to our warehouse. Um, the neighbourhood that's over on the other side of the stream is, is uh, not very wealthy, shall we say, so um, when you go for walks through the park, there's often, you know, graffiti or buildings that are kicked in or things that are burnt or just kind of destructive type behaviours, and it really makes me think about, I guess, the kids that are within these urban environments not having a place where they can go and connect to life force or energy or they haven't been taught those skills and it's not obvious within the landscape so with the te aranga principles I think if we can start nurturing that through the you know it's, it's a bit top down it's the design institutes down kind of thing but if we can change what we see as what is really good design then perhaps we can start reconnecting with that life force which should be in all of our landscapes just because it's an urban landscape with a whole lot of concrete doesn't mean that there shouldn't be a connection or places that people can uh, reconnect with nature and, and feel that life force again. I'm going to take one more question from Slido, which is on cultural protocol. Do you find yourself still being a facilitator for this or are non-Indigenous stakeholders more aware in your experience? Um, constantly a facilitator, to be honest. Like, I get... Um, uh, I'm often being asked by really ABC type questions about Māori culture and whilst I realise that the, you know we do need to push things forward on that side of things and I'm always up for you know opportunities to um, if I can to um, English uh, to support <laughs> uh, the uh, Māori values and try and you know balance out some of that energy. Uh, there's this amazing thing called Google. <laughs> <laughs> so like, what is the Māori word for house? Blah 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 blah. So then maybe the, those of us <laughs> <laughs> Māori practitioners that are working within the space might get an opportunity to dig deeper into some of the conversations and really be able to develop our practices. So, yeah, thank you, Auntie Google, for um, assisting, and please feel, 
free to use it more often. There's amazing Māori dictionaries, there's like Māori uh, <laughs> uh, courses online, there's Māori histories, there's an encyclopedia. So, yeah, no, we do end up often facilitating and having ABC questions again and again. But, you know, Kate's play, we're making a difference over generations. On that uh, rather inspiring note, uh, please uh, join me uh, in thanking uh, Desna Ifana Salom. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Oh.